One of the odd things about talking to you people is everybody here has been a Christian for a very long time or you've been in ministry and you have spent quality, quantity time in God's Word, by and large. So sometimes what I tell you, you have heard more than once, and you're going to hear it again. <laughs> Jesus, in Luke chapter 20, something very unique is happening right now. If you happen to be a lamb in Israel, it's coming up on Passover. From days 10 until days 14, that lamb is being looked over with a fine-toothed comb to find any blemish, any reason that that lamb is not, is not worthy of sacrifice. Is it any coincidence that all these different <clears throat> groups are coming to Jesus Christ and they are examining him? Is there any blemish? Is there any spot? Is there any reason that this person is less, less, less than perfect. And boy, when you look at his answers, you just marvel. But then again, he's God. But you still take it in awe, these kinds of answers that Jesus gives these people as they constantly scrutinize over him, but what they don't realize, while he is being examined, so are they. He is both the Lamb, the Savior, to give his life, as we mentioned in Sunday school, but he is also the judge in this passage. There are four groups, scribes, these are the, well, as Bob would have said once upon a time with my relationship with him, I think I was his, uh, what was the name? Slipped in me. What? Josephine? No, no, that's when I was a secretary. Okay. Uh, no, uh, I, I was studious at the time, and you, you had a name for me. And I can't remember what that meant. Resident name. Egghead. Resident Egghead. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Bob. In a way, they remind me of that. Not so much, just the fact that they were very studious. They wanted to interpret the Word of God correctly. What they had in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, I think it was probably one of the scribes who says, hey, you have answered right. When I look at what you said, i got to hand it to you. You answered right. Then there's another, the, the problem we should probably clarify with the scribes is they've probably gone just a little bit too far in Jesus' day in how they interpret almost a hair-splitting method Sometimes we make things a little too difficult. But one of the things that if you happen to be in child evangelism fellowship, you want to use very simple language. That's going to be really hard for me because I like to mess with the little brains, especially when they're concrete operational. It's just fun to have them look at you like deer in the headlights sometimes and wonder what you just said. And, uh, but that would be me. I get a kick out of it. I'm not sure they do. But uh, in this particular case here, they, they are splitting hairs. And boy, they just need to put it down to brass tacks. The salvation is faith in Christ. Interesting to me as I, as, you know, I share with people because the angels rejoice and the saints rejoice when somebody comes to be with the Lord. But there's always somebody out there from a different religion that says, Something like, make sure you baptize them, or make sure you do this, or make sure you do that, because it's not enough that you believe. Well, I waited just a second here. No, it is enough. You put your faith in Christ. Your trust in Jesus Christ. As you might explain to somebody in a different tribe, like we've explained so many times, the analogy of a chair and and putting your full body weight on that chair, because that chair will hold you. Jesus has finished the job. He came to seek and to save that which is lost, and that is us. So we don't have to make this more difficult. And we should not. Because it is sufficient that Christ died for the ungodly while we were yet sinners. Our part, if any man receive him, to them gave he the power 
to become the sons of God. We have to realize that God is indeed just in the sense that he is going to dispense perfect justice. That God is holy and he cannot have any sin in his sight, even to the point of what's happening on the inside. Some of you have been Christians for a very long time. Mostly, you can keep the outside together. But a lot of times what happens with you where the fight really takes traction and where the war is really waged by the Spirit of God is on the inside. And the inside could never go to heaven if Christ didn't die for the inside as well as the external. Such that he is in this beautiful process of having saved us, having paid for the penalty of sin, but he will present us before the Father with exceeding joy. That means when God looks upon us, he will only see the purity of Jesus Christ. There will be no possibility that we can take the flesh, the inside, the inner rebellious working against God. That will not be in heaven. Thankful, Lord. Your fight is on now, but your fight has a graduation day. And when you take your last breath, you won't ever sin again. And it doesn't mean because you'll be as dead as a doorknob. You will be just as alive as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are in this passage today. Moving along, we have the Pharisees. They had a pretty good beginning. They wanted to protect a pure... Judaism free from the world, free from outside influence. By the time they get to Christ's time, obviously there's some serious problems. They desire to see the kingdom of God. They desire to see the kingdom of heaven. They do believe in the resurrection. The next group, obviously, Sadducees. It's interesting to me that they were the priests. If ever there was a misfit for office, because it was Rome that chose who the priest would be, by my understanding. Now, I wish to ask you, is, is there, a, I, I see a, a little, what does that mean? They, they bought it. Oh, they what? They bought, they they bought the office. To, they, paid, they paid Rome to, for the priest's office. All right. <laughs> Corruption. Obviously, this is, this is, totally makes a person disqualified for the priest's office. Okay? Thank you for the clarification, Eddie. I just knew that Rome had a whole lot to do with it. Rome is not good at teaching, and I'm talking Caesar's Rome, Bible doctrine. <laughs> Rome is not good at figuring out who makes a godly priest. And certainly if they're buying it, that is a disqualification off the top. When I was a kid, and some of you may have been in a church like I was. Did you ever have an adult tell you that the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection? Anybody like that? Yeah, a few of you, all right? And I remember that all my life. They are sad, you see. For then there is no resurrection, quite literally, because they're not going to put their faith in Christ. Unless they put their faith in Christ, that's where it all lasts. And finally... We have the final group, the Herodians, and pretty much they're a political group, and their only great desire is to keep a Herod on the throne somewhere in the land, from what I understand. I think it's interesting for you Greek people that the word, when they ask Jesus a question, the word that's used is logon, kind of like logos. And I, I just think that's interesting. In, in English, if I were to approach you, in English, I would say, may I have a word with you? you know, I, and, and that seems to be what's happening. All these different groups want to have a word with Jesus Christ. Fascinating. We see the word rejected in this passage also, about verse 17. It means to reject after investigation. Hmm. And yet Jesus looks into their hearts. He sees the unbelief. He sees the ignorance. He sees the hatred. And he realizes this does not pass his test, his examination. Question number one. We have a series of questions in this passage. 
The first question is, by what authority do you do what you do in the temple? I, I think this is interesting. Here is God in the temple, and they're saying, what right do you have here? <laughs> but, you know, we know he's God. They didn't understand this. They didn't get this. But if they truly understood the passage in David that we're going to get to, they would understand God is in the temple. God has the ultimate, all authority in heaven and in earth in the temple. It would be like a fourth grader walking up to me and say, hey, step aside, Pastor Joe, I'd like to teach concert band today, high school. It could never happen. He doesn't have that authority. He's never taken any classes. He doesn't, he has nothing. But in Jesus' case, he has all authority. Certainly some of these priests would not have authority, though they assumed an office. The priests derived their authority primarily from Moses. The scribes, it would seem, well, also, no, the, uh, the scribes would appeal to their rabbis, and they want to know where, because they don't recognize he is their Messiah. He's the promised one. So he asks a question to them in verse 3. This is beautiful. This is the sort of thing I could never do, but then again, this is God here. In fact, some of the best moments of your life is when you couldn't do something and God did it instead. Hmm? Or when there was a spiritual battle and God fought it instead of you. And he answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? It's interesting here. You know, there is a spiritual principle. If you respond to the light that God gives you, he'll give you more light. If you reject the light that God gives you, you will continue, if not worse, harden yourself to that light. The case in point is a child is much easier to bring to Jesus than an adult. Or somebody who has lived their whole life, if somebody gets saved and they're quite elderly, to me that's a pretty cool miracle. <laughs> All right. It seems easier Although sometimes I wonder, may I, may I clarify easier? Sometimes I'm scared, but I would share the gospel with a child anyway, but I, I would be afraid in, in, in this fear that the Holy Spirit truly grabbed that child's heart. I think it's a tricky business. As parents, you know this to be true. M many times we're watching even the next generation of Peter start to accept Jesus as Savior. And as grandparents, we're looking for, okay, if Jesus comes in, there's going to be a spiritual appetite, and we're asking, as we watch them, how's the appetite for Jesus? Now, we're not being the ultimate judge. I believe God's the ultimate judge, but it's something you look for. You can look for fruit. You can expect it. If Jesus moves in and is indwelling you, there ought to be fruit in the life, a growing desire for Christ. What about John? <coughs> well, they know they're in trouble. <laughs> Verse 5, they reason within themselves. If we say, John, got his authority from heaven, he's going to say, why didn't you believe me? Verse 6, but and if we say, John got his authority from men, all the people will stone us. They are persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered him, that they could not tell from where it was. What do you do when you don't want to answer something? Anybody ever deal with a group of kids? Your own kids, maybe? What, what happened to the front window? I don't know. <laughs> Whose authority was it? Uh, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Very same thing. You notice how from Adam and Eve we keep repeating the same patterns over and over and long after we go, at least for a thousand years in my picture, <laughs> there will be the same pattern to the end of the age. It just goes back to show that sin is really in our hearts. We are born in it 
And it's so deep. Only God's beautiful miracle can take it out. And Jesus rightly says to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do what I do. And perfectly justified in saying that. Well, Jesus is going to take them, all of them, to a something that originally happens in Isaiah chapter 5. And you could turn there. Isaiah chapter 5 is to describe, and probably to the Pharisee to some degree, what John 3.16 is to us. If I say John 3.16, probably most of you have recited it from memory countless times. I started when I was six, and I had not forgotten John 3.16 since that time. <coughs> and I cannot tell you how many times. And I recite it at the nursing home every week with people because it's an important verse where we're talking about God's love, God's salvation, that Jesus was offered for us. And I want to get back to that point every week with them. That's what Isaiah 5 has to be for, to these people. This is known territories. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I will sing to my well-beloved a psalm of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, that's to keep the deer out, <laughs> and he gathered stones thereof, and he planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also a winepress therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. I don't like wild grapes. Usually, on a good year, I'll get 10 gallons off my vine out and back, but I think we have a bird problem this year because I saw a bunch of birds in my grapes. When it came time for harvest, there weren't any left. Fortunately, Dad had a grape vine. It didn't look much better because deer are all over his yard, so it's trimmed absolutely perfect to about chest high, and then it bushes way out, and you have huge clusters of grapes from there on up. Between the two of us, we probably wouldn't have had much this year, but at least we got something because the top third of Dad's vine was still good. I have wild grapes in my yard. They grow tiny little peas. I've never actually chewed on one for fear they might be poisonous. I have no idea. I'm not going to find out. But even if I could, what a letdown. I want a grape. I don't want a grape. A wild grape. It is unsatisfactory. And God is looking for fruit. He wants real fruit. He doesn't want this. He wants this. I looked. It brought wild grapes. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for it that I haven't done? Wherefore, when I looked at it, it would bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now you go, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'm going to take the hedge away. I'm taking the fence down, let the deer in, let them eat it up. I'm going to break down the wall. It shall be trodden over. I'll lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or digged. There shall come up briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of the hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah is his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, for justice, for fairness, as we understand it, but he sees oppression. He looks for righteousness, but he sees a cry. Psalm 80, thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, and you've cast out the heathen, and you planted it. That's the background. And then he launches into the parable at verse 9. Looking at their unbelief. Verse 9, then began Jesus, John chapter 20, verse 9. Then began he to speak to the people a parable, a certain man planted a vineyard, and he led it forth to husbandmen, and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen, that they should give him the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandmen beat him. They sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant. And they beat him and entreated him shamefully and sent him away. He sent a third. They wounded him and cast him out. 
Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore will the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Probably, I'm going to guess it was, uh, let it not be born. I forget what the word is, but y'all know the word. Perish the thought, we might say. Interesting. And he beheld these people who were blind, who rejected his authority, who were trying to catch him in his words so that they might have a real reason to crucify him, but they could not because he was perfect. He's the only Lamb of God who can take away the sin of the world. And he's going to do that voluntarily. And he's giving them this to understand they are going to do this shortly. This is crucifixion week. The lamb is now being inspected, but the lamb is also inspecting. And he tells them this truth in verse 17. Behold, he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. This, of course, is taken from one of the most quoted texts in the Old Testament, the Messianic uh, Psalm. I think it's most quoted, or maybe it's, maybe it's not. I think it's Psalm 110 that's most quoted. But this is Psalm 118.22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is the foundation, period. No man gets to the Father but through me. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life, he is the foundation. Have a neighbor putting in a, well, a potential neighbor, let's put it that way, putting in a home right next to us. And the very first thing they did is they poured that foundation and then they put rebar in, I'd say about eight feet high, maybe higher, I didn't, I'm not a measuring guy. And from that rebar, then they poured another round of cement, so it looked like perfectly formed bricks all the way around, and they wrapped it up. That thing, if there is a tornado, I'm going to his house. <laughs> I don't want to stay in my house. There's nowhere to go, and I haven't found a hole in the yard big enough for that sort of thing. But, <clears throat> what a foundation. And there is no other foundation than that which is laid. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is that most important stone that holds up the entire structure. Without Jesus, you have no salvation. You have no structure. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And if Jesus were yet in the grave, we of all men would be most miserable. But we don't have to be. I'm to rejoice in the Lord always and again and rejoice again. I'm not rejoicing in me. I'm not rejoicing in circumstances I might see. I'm not rejoicing necessarily in hurdles, although I kind of like the challenge. Oh, bring on a hurdle, Lord. This could be cool. All right. <laughs> that's just, that's my modus operandi. I've learned over time that Jesus is able to do above and beyond everything that I can ask or think. And it's not just a sweet little phrase from the Bible. It's an experience that what Jesus can say and what he can do, he is able to do. Oh, I love it. Well, John the Baptist beheaded, and then religious leaders want to frame Jesus for the crucifixion. They are rejecting this message. They are rejecting this stone. Ultimately, they reject Stephen and the apostles, the good news, and it's going to go throughout the rest of the world to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, they're going to hear the gospel. May I say, did you notice in this parable, and it's happening now, it will continue to happen as a historic fact, the further and further and further a person or persons get into sin, the more, the greater the intensity 
Oh, we'll just treat this one bad. Oh, we'll, we'll treat this one really bad. We're going to break his leg. We're going to kill him. Be aware of the pattern. Be aware of the pattern. But be aware that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter what the pattern is. Yes, they can kill the Son of God, but they can't keep him there. And they couldn't kill him unless he voluntarily said, Okay, fine. It is finished. Amen. The payment for sin is done. And by the way, ultimately, yes, Jesus said, Yes, they could kill your body. But they can't destroy your soul. You are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. Even if you were like sheep led to the slaughter repeatedly. We're not under Rome. I'm thankful for that. I don't want to see what Rome would do to all my friends and family. We're in the United States. It's not that far yet. There are unpleasant things you hear about. It's not that far yet. Oh, but... Even in the darkest situation, you are more than a conqueror. Don't you forget it. Don't allow yourself. Remember what we said a few weeks ago. You're in a war. Don't be shocked. I'm in a war. <laughs> They're using the real bullets here. It's okay. As long as God is glorified, hey, this is going to be cool. Just hang on to the right and see what God can do. Well, moving along here, check out, check out this here. Uh, hmm, page three. Did I get to page three? Oh, I'm on the bottom of page three. Good. I was looking for where I was. Sorry. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we ought to give, considering that this stone could come down and crush a person. Anybody know what brimstone really is? Mountains of sulfur, right? Did anybody ever hit your hand with a hammer? Or crush your hand, slam it in a locker at school like I did. I remember doing that, and then I had to play piano. <laughs> Have something drop on your foot, stub your toe. Doesn't hold a candle to being crushed between two mountains of brimstone all the time for eternity future in a lake of fire. And it's full of fire and brimstone. Doesn't hold a candle to it. There's no anesthesia in hell. There's no coma in hell. There is no hope in hell except to be eternally punished forever. Because the greatest love and the greatest gift has been shown to us and we were bold enough and brave enough to say, I don't want it. That's the problem. We reject Jesus. And that's a big problem. But understand the flip side of the coin. He cares about you and he wants you. He's not willing that anybody should perish. But there will be some people worse. And Jesus gives them the warning. Look, if you fall on me, yeah, you're going to break. You're going to find out that you're a sinner. You're going to find out that, guess what? You know what? It's not just the externals you do. It's not like robbing a bank or killing someone will keep you out of heaven. If you did it in here, you did it. It cannot be in the presence of God. It kind of hurts. To honestly evaluate ourselves in the sight of the Holy God and realize, God, it would be a huge miracle to save me. Because I can now see inside my heart and realize that would disqualify me from heaven. Most people think, well, all I ever told was little white lies. <laughs> Just took a piece of candy or there, a cookie out of the jar, whatever you thought you could get by with. Well, I was only angry at them for a little while, or to use childhood language, I just slugged my brother once. <laughs> That's not original, by the way. I was just kind of watching the CEF, and I'm not tuned into that world, but I thought, that sounds about right. But we have to understand our need is immense, but our Savior is bigger. Amen. You know? The big problem is taken care of. Hmm. We ought to give more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, 
How shall we escape if we neglect? Everybody say that good and loud. Neglect. What are we doing when we reject Jesus? We what? We need, oh, come on, guys. You're so soft. I want the people out there to hear you. What do we do? We neglect, neglect God who loves us. Do you like being neglected? I don't. I mean, it's a big issue nowadays, you know? Kids from neglect, and, and you feel you're sad that they have gone through what they've gone through. I worked in a boys' home for two and a half years, or two years. It was something like that. Anyway, it was more than I could handle <laughs> I was done at 1.5 mentally, physically, emotionally, but part of the problem was neglect. If there truly were, as uh, Bill Rice the second said Sunday, if there truly were men who would obey God, then maybe so many of these family problems that we see would dissipate. doesn't mean that there aren't family problems down the ladder, but a lot of the responsibility is upon a man. Neglect. If we neglect, what? So great a salvation. This is above and beyond the call of any duty at all. God never sinned. We are the people born in it. We are the people committing sin, voluntarily, volitionally saying, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That's the modus operandi. I think I've said that twice and probably mispronounced it for folks in sin. They want to kill Jesus because now he's spoken the parable. It's kind of like saying, it's almost like prophesying, saying, hey guys, this is what you're going to do. And they will. But understand that it is not they themselves. One, if you happen to be a Jew and you happen to hear this right now, it's not your fault or your nation's fault in and of itself. We are all sinners and we are the people, all people, put Jesus Christ on the cross. It is for our sin collectively that he died. Now it was his own nation that crucified him and his own nation paid a huge price for the rejection of God. His own nation was sent out. That's a truth that Jesus speaks of. But understand that when it comes to Jesus dying on Calvary, he did it for me and he did it for you and he did it for everyone in the world and he did it because he loved you and he knew this would happen. And on the third day, he came back to life. He says, I can lay my life down and I can bring it right back. And he did. Praise the Lord. We serve the risen Savior. By what authority? Interesting that these people watched him. Watched him with intent. Watched him examining him. How can I trap you in your words so that I have legal recourse to put you to death? That's real religious, isn't it? That's real religion, actually. That's what religion is. What religion ought to be is looking out for widows and looking out for orphans and doing good things and, and taking care of those less fortunate. That's what religion ought to be, according to James. But what religion often becomes is, how can I trap you and punish you for it? That's what they wanted to do to Jesus. They wanted to kill him. And he perceives their craftiness. Why do you... T oh, oh, I'm jumping ahead, sorry. The chief priests and scribes sought to kill him, and they watched, watched with intent to destroy. One person said, insidiously watched him, and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves to be just men, that they might take hold of his words, so they might deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, you that say and teach perfectly. Oh, and you don't change just because of who shows up. Nobody's going to sway you. Let's get some butter out. Let's butter it up real good. A little bit of flattery here. And they asked him, Master, we know what you say and what you teach is right. 
You're not going to accept anybody's person. You teach the way of God truly. They had to choke on their own word to put that out there. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? It feels to me like this is the second time they're doing. One of the principles is watch out for flattery. It's out there. It comes from time to time. You've got to watch for it. And he says, why are you tempting me? Show me a penny. Whose picture is on this penny? It's Caesar's picture. Then give Caesar his money. And you give God what belongs to him. What belongs to God? You do. You belong to God. He created you. He owns you by right of creation. Secondly, he has a right to own you in the second birth, may I say. When he died on the cross for you and he rose again for your sins, he owns you on that principle as well. Interesting here in this case that it seems like the Pharisees and the Herodians may have teamed up in Mark chapter 12. They're basically enemies. They, they would do away with each other in a heartbeat, but not when they were trying to catch Jesus in his words. You belong to God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, from the inside out acceptable to God. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Shut the uh, camera off. I was 